Um, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for listening to what I've eventually got to say. I am um, not very good with IT, as you might have um, picked up. And I just I was just going to talk a little bit about how I survived a little bit of major trauma. Um, and the reason that I spoke to um, Mr. Porter about it is because I've been in the job for quite a while and I'm quite passionate about my job um, and I just wondered whether there was anything that could come out of it that might be beneficial to people on the kind of front line. Um, I'm going to talk about my role in the other side of major trauma. Um, there's not going to be any clinical pearls but hopefully there'll be some useful observations. Um, it certainly changed my practice, it certainly made me um, a little bit more thoughtful about what I do and it was just so amazingly instructive being on the other side and um, so a bit about me I um, am quite old I qualified in 1991 in Birmingham um, and I've done a mix of um, jobs I've been mainly uh, kind of non-ward based I've done a decent amount of ITU burns trauma pain management anesthetics I do a bit of aesthetics as well now um, and the state of me there in the mud is when I do um, a bit of pre-hospital care with Festival mm. Medical Services. So I've done for about 15 years, been um, on the front line really at, par at festivals, being being a, playing at being a paramedic, um, Glastonbury, Reading, those kind of things, which is a, which is great fun, but it's very very challenging. Um, so as I say, I qualified in Birmingham in 1991. I went to Kent and then I went to London. I went to Australia. And then in 95, I came back to Birmingham, not really knowing what I wanted to do. And I kind of got, I ended up in the major injuries unit at Selly Oak Hospital. Um, I didn't even know I wanted to do ITU. And it was a five bedded, purely trauma unit, as was the old Aki Hospital in Birmingham. And it was absolutely fabulous. It was a fabulous team. It, I learned so much. It was very much a consultant led and delivered unit, which um, now I realize how, how much I love that. Um, it, it was seriously the best, the best place I've ever worked. And um, we used to get toast at 11 o'clock, the ward clerk, everything used to start when we used to get toast at 11 o'clock. Not that that's what it's all about. Um, anyway, I stayed in acute care from then. I then went up and worked at the Queen Elizabeth, which was the, part of the same trust, um, and did a lot of ITU, a lot of outreach, a lot of acute, um, acute pain management. And by then, we were a military hospital, which I'm, I know that most people all know, um, and had really, really good experience looking after really badly injured soldiers and military and really good experience with pain control pain management and the whole kind of social psychosocial aspects of it and then I got to the stage where I was kind of quite senior in intensive care and I didn't want to go into management I wanted to stay clinical and stay with patients so I was lucky enough to be accepted onto the um, postgraduate diploma in anesthesia um, as uh, well, we are anaesthesia associates now. It was the PG dip in anaesthesia at Birmingham University. And I started that in 2006. Um, we were anaesthetic practitioners at the time. And I qualified in 2009. And I worked at the Queen Elizabeth um, as an anaesthetic associate for quite a while. Um, I eventually moved from the QE in 2016 down to Dorset and I thought in the back of my mind I'm getting a bit older having a quiet life um, it's very very um, different in Dorset the nearest major trauma centre is Southampton which is about an hour away there's also one in Bristol which is about an hour away this is by road um, the nearest Burns unit is Salisbury again by um, an A road so it was very different to what I was used to working in a, you know, a constantly thrashed environment at the Queen Elizabeth and, you know, constantly admitting patients, really, really sick patients. Um, it's not a wild place, Dorset, but it is surrounded by things that 
um, give you angst. Um, I've learned many things. Um, we get a massive influx of tourists every year and they do silly things like climb Dirtle Door in their flip-flops and fall off. Um, the other thing is farmers. Farmers are indestructible. And if you get a farmer in who says they feel a little bit unwell, then you need to call the merit team or get them an ITU bed. There's loads and loads of scope for hideous um, recreational and agricultural accidents. So although I thought it would be, you know, just ASA ones and twos and plodding along, um, you do get your moments of, of horrific stuff. And as I'm sure a lot of people know, it's it's one of only five counties um, in the in England without a motorway. And A roads are much, much worse especially when you've got grockles, as they're called, visitors coming down, they don't know the roads, and you've got tractors, you've got combine harvesters, you've got caravans, and everyone's in a hurry to get everywhere because there's no motorways. Anyway, um, we do have an air ambulance, the Dorset and Somerset Air Ambulance. It flies from seven o'clock in the morning till two o'clock at night. And when I had my accident, I knew that because one of my friends is a doctor on the ambulance. It's a very, mm. very, very small county. Um, everybody knows everybody else. And when I first got here, I was warned, just be careful what you do or what you say, because everybody will find out. It's not like Birmingham at all. Um, so we, as I say, we get these big influx, influxes of visitors and it is quite a busy, busy place. People doing silly things because they're on holiday and you know they're indestructible. I've never been a fan of balloons, particularly, like everyone else, I suppose. Um, but on the 11th of August in 2018, I thought I'd better do my bit for the for the um, charity because I would been to Reading, been to Glastonbury, done this, that and the other. I thought I'll do my bit and go to a bit of a rubbishy festival. And that was the Bristol Balloon Festival in 2018. And so I, um, it was Saturday morning. I was heading for, to Bristol at 4.20. I'd had an uncharacteristic early night. I hadn't had much to drink. I even went for a run and I just thought I'm going to be fresh. I'm going to be bright eyed. Um, I left the house, had a cup of tea with me. I hate mornings. I just got in my car, put the radio on and drove to Bristol. Plenty of time, not late. Again, quite uncharacteristic. And this is the road. Um, it's uh, a national speed limit road. I looked at the time. I thought I'm not rushed. That's great. Radio was on. Um, I didn't see a single car and I'd probably gone about six miles and it, you can see how long and straight the road is. I saw pinpoint pupils in the distance. Um, it's a single carriageway. It's completely straight, slight undulations. Um, it's well known locally as being a hideous road. Nobody likes it. There's a couple of pubs along there. There's um, big warnings up. It's really busy on the weekdays because it's the main road coming from uh, Yeovil and Sherbourne to Dorchester so it's very very busy on weekdays really mm. quiet on the weekends extremely quiet at what was uh, 4.40 in the morning um, so I was driving along not a care in the world and saw the pinpoint headlights didn't think anything of it and then suddenly a, a boom and I can only describe it as a as a a boom I don't I did not know what had happened it was just incredibly disorientating um I was coughing there was a hideous smell it was thick black smoke the noise was horrific um it was really really hot it was just all I didn't know what on earth had happened I was lucky I wasn't knocked out but I just didn't know what was happening what had happened and I was trying to make sense of it there was tinkling, there was hissing. Uh, as I say, it was really, really hot. And I just thought, what on earth has happened? And everything went quiet. And I kind of thought in that split second, something's changed here. Um, so there was, there was dead silence. And then I heard a phone ringing. And I thought to myself, I don't know how I thought to myself, I thought, whoever was in that car was on the phone because who would phone someone at quarter to five in the morning? I didn't really know what time it was. Um, 
but I heard the phone ringing and I shouted as much as I could answer the phone answer the phone and they didn't it kept ringing and then it rang off um I looked to my right and I saw a car facing the same direction as me and my windows were completely smashed and um, I was kind of trapped in the um, cab not that I knew that at the time um, and I thought oh god what a mess I just thought what a mess how am I going to explain this um, and then I realized that I was in absolute agony I felt like I'd had an explosion in my pelvis and I the only way I can describe it to people and I described it to the surgeons was I felt like I'd been excuse what I'm going to say I felt like I'd been kicked up the bum as hard as anyone possibly could with a massive hobnail boot on and I was trying to get off um, the seat to try and relieve the pain but all, equally, I was in the middle of nowhere. My phone had been my sat nav. It was gone. It was smashed. There was glass everywhere. I was um, pretty much cut, cut to bits. Um, and I sat there and thought, am I dead? I actually thought, is this what it's like to be dead? And then I thought, no, I'm, I'm don't, I don't think I am dead. And I had this amazing feeling of calm. I you know, I just was completely and utterly calm. I thought, right, what do I need to do now? What do I need to do now? But there was nothing I could do. I'd lost my phone. I was scrabbling around in my bag to try and get my iPad out, which obviously wouldn't have had any reception either. Um, I did a sketchy primary survey. I thought, right, OK, I'm not dead and it can't be this painful if I am dead. And I was in a, an, in a lot of pain. And at this point, his phone rang again and I shouted at him and all I could hear was um, awful kind of guttural agonal breathing and when you're in the job as you all know your kind of instinct is to try and get out and help I could hear he was massively obstructing his airway I tried to get out I couldn't get out I thought I was trapped but it turns out I wasn't trapped my I didn't have any sensation from below my waist at that stage um check your horn so many people have said to me afterwards did you not think to sound your horn and obviously now I would but um I never thought to sound my horn it was in the middle of nowhere just to the left of the blue car which is what I was driving is a chicken farm and that was dimly lit up um and I should have just hammered on my horn maybe somebody would have heard maybe a chicken would have heard um anyway these were the cars before this was my car um on the right the Subaru and this was the same as his car um, that hit me approximately at 65 miles an hour. I was driving at 50. And I only know that because I went through the national speed limit and checked my, um, my speed. And I've since found out that Subarus are amazing for saving your life. And I drive a Subaru now. Um, his car, there was, as you'll see in a little while, there was absolutely nothing left of it. And, and weirdly, about a month before I'd got rid of my golf, which was a convertible because I was buying a house and I was advised to get rid of my car loan. So I bought this Subaru and um, all the comments in the press and the locals were saying, oh, typical young lads driving Subarus, they're a nightmare. And I had to kind of say, actually, it was me and the Subaru. Anyway, the Subaru saved my life. But we were in the middle of nowhere. And um, I kind of knew that he was either dead or very, very close to it. And I didn't know what to do. And nobody turned up apart from his girlfriend who turned up and had heard the crash because, as I thought, they were on the phone. They'd had an argument. He was speeding. He was late for work. Um, and he was on the phone to her and they were arguing and she'd heard the crash and she'd heard me scream. Um, so she turned up and I thought that the cars were going to um, explode because it was really hot and there was this hissy noise, smell of petrol. And so I said to her, do not come near the cars. And she said, I told him not to speed. He was angry. Um, I told him not to rush for work. He was late for work. Um, I don't know whether that helped or not, but it kind of cemented in my mind that I, I knew what, what had kind of happened. Um, 
as I say, it was in the middle of nowhere. Um, I had no phone. There was lots of blood, lots of glass. It was cold. Um, I was in lots and lots of pain. I knew that he was dead at this stage. Um, and I, I only had pain in my pelvis, but going back to ALS back in the day, I was thinking, I know that a, a high speed collision <clears throat> head on is very bad. So I was a bit worried about that. I was fit. I was extremely fit at the time. I was a regular runner and cyclist. Um, so I did my own kind of primary survey. I thought, well, my airway's all right because I'm screaming and swearing. My breathing's all right because I couldn't stop coughing, which obviously hurt my pelvis. Um, there was lots of blood around and I had the presence of thought to check for a radial, which I had, which was fine. And I thought, well, my head's all right because I'm reasonably sensible. But I was really haunted by the ATLS back in the day when I'd done it as an observer years and years ago. And I absolutely convinced myself that I'd survived it, but I was going to do a, a Princess Diana and bleed out from a, a major um, vessel, which I thought that would just be my luck. And then after a while, I hadn't died. So I thought, OK, it's not that. Um, OK, so I just need to sit here and wait. And it's really, really difficult to just sit there and wait and wait for someone to come. And somebody did come in the end. It was a chap, ironically, who was going to Dorchester for some dialysis. So he was up and up and about early. And um, he didn't want to come anywhere near the accident. So he shouted over that he would get help. And I asked him to come get me out. And he just he refused. But he did, he did call for help. Um, help took quite a long time to come. I, I know now that it took about an hour before help arrived, but a big friendly guy arrived on the direction of from the direction of Dorchester, and I thought he was so calm. He reached into my car and turned the ignition off, which I didn't even know was still running, and he really calmed me down. And he really calmed me down by just talking to me, and I was telling, "Get me out, get me out, get me out," and he just said, "You know, I can't do that," and. As I say, I thought he was a policeman. It turns out I've met him since. He is so far removed from being a policeman. But he was really kind and he really, really helped me. He also dealt with the deceased's mother who turned up at the scene. And at this stage, I didn't really know that the, the chap in the other car was, was dead, I just presume. Um, I thought I was trapped. But it turns out that my legs were completely numb from the spinal injury. And I thought my feet were trapped under the pedals. He was brilliant, really, 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 really reassuring and just really kind. Eventually, the police, fire and rescue and the ambulance arrived. Um, and this is something that really sticks in my mind. They came and they took control of the scene, but they didn't tell me anything. I, the first I heard was um, on the radio, the, um, the guy that leads the kind of thing, the, the fireman, the lead, said uh, to his control, we're at this RTC, there's a male deceased in the car and a female with life-threatening injuries. And I then thought, oh, perhaps I'm worse than I thought. So that was the first thing about hearing that kind of thing about yourself. Anyway, um, they cut the roof off the car and I had the spinal board and all the rest of it. And I was begging and probably sounded really, really inappropriate um, for drugs, anything. Can you give me some fentanyl, ketamine, morphine, entonox, anything? And pain that severe, I've, I've got a degree in pain management and I never realised how pain that severe can make you so irrational. I've, I've taught lots of um, people about the effects of decent analgesia on somebody who's really struggling with pain. And I always used to say, you know, um, the first thing that will happen is that they will become more rational. And it is so true. You, you know that you're being irrational, but you just can't help it because that pain is all consuming. Um, so I had some IV paracetamol and um, I had a brilliant extrication. Weirdly, I'd... Um, I'd had some extrication experience as a student nurse down in Kent on the lifeboats. So I knew what was going to happen and I knew it was going to be very noisy. And I knew that the, 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 the um, jaws of life were going to be crunchy and really close to me. 
but it was a brilliant extrication and they got me out and I didn't I still didn't realize weirdly that my legs were were numb or if I did realize I didn't care um so they got me out and as they got me out being Mrs Nosy I was like oh is that his engine in the road and they were like don't you worry about that and in my head I knew that an engine in the road is again a really bad thing um and they told me don't you worry about that love so I didn't um I went off to Yeovil and I um it's a district general hospital very small um I remember thinking it would take absolutely ages but it, it went in a heartbeat um and I got to Yeovil and as I said before this area is a very very small area and I was pushed into recess and the, the recess team were there waiting and they introduced, they said, this is your anaesthetist. And I looked up and it was an anaesthetist that I work with day in, day out in my normal job. And he was doing a locum. Now, I was quite shocked, but he was more shocked. Um, he asked me, what are you doing? Have you been out? He thought I was coming in from having been out from a night. I don't know what they think of me. But anyway, um, and then I was put in the scanner and it revealed that I had a um, an H-shaped pelvic, fra pelvic fracture and um, spinal sacral, uh, pelvic, pelvic sacral um, dissociation. Um, I can't really make sense of this, but I'm people that have seen it um, seem to know what it means. Um, these were these were my injuries, but I was told there that um, I had quite bad pelvic injuries and uh, spinal pelvic dissociation and that I needed to go to a trauma center. Um, I also had lots of um, other injuries. I had fractured ribs. I had um, a, a tuft fracture in my thumb and lots and lots of soft tissue injuries that were bleeding quite a lot. And they cleaned those out in, in recess. And weirdly I felt really calm in, in in recess and that's a testament to the staff there I think um I loved the fact I want to get that off sorry I'm trying to um okay the routine that these were my observations from a and &E because I knew what the routine was going to be it was so reassuring I knew what was going to happen and I got there and it was lovely and warm and the A&E consultant explained exactly what was going to happen to me um, and I felt exactly where I should be and so it's very very reassuring um, the weird thing was my because I couldn't feel my knees I had quite a lot of open injuries to my knees and feeling my legs I don't know whether you'll know I didn't know exposed what bone is really warm and quite rough quite ribbed and I was feeling my knee thinking oh, what's that not being able to feel it apart from with my hand and it was bone and it felt quite nice really um I had ketamine and the k-hole like my um like my patients at Glastonbury and Reading would say is at absolutely lovely and you really do like being in there it took all the problems away for about five minutes um as long as you give enough pain relief the pain will go and I was given a lot of pain relief in in ED which was great and one of the ED consultants was really really honest with me and really kind and he explained what was happening and for me that was just the best thing and I know that's not for everyone but he told me that I had quite extensive injuries that I was going to need to go quite quickly to a trauma unit that was going to be Bristol and that they were ready to accept me and that I was going ASAP and the other thing it's just a nicety but being warm really really helps when you're cold and in pain it's much worse than being warm and in pain So I um, got to Bristol and I had quite serious spinal injuries, as I've already said. Um, I had lots of fractures. I had lots of pain. Um, 
I was eventually went to surgery. I got there on the Saturday and the rest of it was a bit of a blur. I went to trauma HDU, lots of pain relief. And then on the Wednesday, I went to theatre and I had a 10 hour, 10 and a bit hour surgery to fix my pelvis and spine. During that time, my legs were completely numb, but weirdly, it, it for some reason didn't bother me. Whereas I think now it would really, really freak me out. Um, once I'd had my surgery, I woke up in recovery and I could feel tingling in my feet, which was which was great. Um, it was quite a rough ride. I was struggling a bit, but um, felt much, 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 much better. Um, I was in hospital for in um, Bristol for three weeks over the bank holiday weekend, which isn't for the faint hearted. There was lots of locum people coming in and out who didn't really know what was going on and it was quite it was quite a trying time and they were desperate to repatriate me back to Dorset um, but there were no beds I was scared because I was immobile and I felt vulnerable and then I started thinking about all the things about I'm going to get a blood clot I'm going to get a fat embolus I'm going to get this that and the other all the things that you overthink but in the meantime I was desperately trying to be a good patient I didn't want to be one of those annoying moaning you know complaining patients um and it's interesting when when i quote risks now as a a clinician um it doesn't really mean much to me but when you hear the risks quoted to you you maybe me but you automatically think on the negative side so when i was told you've got a 50 percent chance of walking again i thought I wouldn't walk, but I knew I would. And equally, 50% chance of living continent. Um, that was my big drive. I was determined that that was, I was, I was going to be continent, if nothing else. Um, I was absolutely worn out, but desperate to be a good patient. Um, after three and a bit weeks, I was transferred to the Duke of Formal Spinal Treatment Centre in Salisbury. Um, and I was kind of warned by the trauma coordinators in Bristol that they would want to deal with me their way. Um, I got there, it was an ambulance ride, and they weren't prepared. I, walk, I was wheeled into a unit where everybody was a serious spinal injury, lots of trackies, um, and I felt like it was a step back and I was absolutely devastated. I felt that I was getting on really, really well. And then I was taken to this unit where everyone was bed bound. There were trackies, as I say, there were people with severe head injuries, people that were clearly never going to have any use of their lower, lower and upper limbs again. Um, and I was met by the consultant who explained to me that this was a nurse led unit and um, that the nurses would be in charge of my care and that he would see me once a week. And I felt abandoned. I felt really, really abandoned. I felt like they'd written me off. And it was at this stage that the consultant said to me, um, well, you're here for rehabilitation for your traumatic cord equina injury, which I didn't know that I had. And that was quite a big moment in my life when when he said that and no one had ever mentioned it before um anyway it was excellent excellent nursing care and therapist care at Salisbury um I was in a club of my own the ward manager told me because they weren't used to people that could walk I was told a million times how lucky I was I didn't, I didn't feel lucky but I was told you're in a you're in a club of your own um but but Interestingly, the patients there didn't want to speak to me because they were a lot worse than me. They couldn't walk. And so I was very much um, given the side eye because I think I could get up and just about walk about. When I say walk, um, I wasn't brilliant. Please excuse the clothing I'm wearing. It's great, my sister. She it. lent them to me. I wouldn't. That's not normally what I would wear. So I learned to walk. And that's my massively supportive, supportive boyfriend, who is still with me now. Um, probably walk still the same as that now. Um, when I was at Salisbury, rehab was very, very much the, um, the focus. 
but my wrist had always been a problem. And when I was at um, Bristol, the, the aim was to get up, get up, get up, push up, come on, push up. I kept moaning about my wrist and I'd had this tough fracture in my thumb and I kept moaning about my wrist, but I equally didn't want to moan. I wanted to be a good patient and, you know, I'd been through such a lot and I just thought, you know, it must just be a sprain. But it really, I was really struggling with it at Salisbury. So eventually I got seen by a plastic surgeon. They don't have an orthopedic unit there. The plastic surgeon examined my wrist and said, no, it's absolutely fine. Um, but we don't look above the hand. We don't um, you look above there. But um, the consultant advised me to see my GP when I got home. And it was my 50th birthday at the end of the week. And I was hell bent on getting home. And they kept me a bed overnight so I could go home. Um, I struggled with my wrist and while I was still at Salisbury I emailed a consultant that I work with I do his list on um on a Tuesday and I emailed him and said I'm sorry to bother you I've had this accident my wrist is really sore so he saw me um and I mean I, this means nothing to me this x-ray but he saw me and I'd fractured my, the waist of my scaphoid and the hook of my hamate and the base of my third metacarpal. And I had an extensive carpi ulnari tendon injury and a contusion of my distal radius, hence the, hence why it was sore. Um, and that's the thing, nobody listened. The physio didn't listen. The nurses didn't listen, nobody listened. Um, and I don't think I was a particular moaner. I tried very hard not to be. So anyway, so my wrist was fixed in the November following the accident in the August. I then developed a traumatic dupatrons, uh, which was then fixed with a, uh, um, a dermofasciectomy and a skin graft. And I've still got a left ulnaris um, ongoing problem. Um, but it really, really brought home to me something that I learned very, very early on from um, the major injuries unit is just be so aware of distraction injuries and if you've got an injury in a limb from something like that there's bound to be something else I, I didn't even think about it because it was me but I knew that there was something wrong and they were very very apologetic in Bristol but um, I would just like to say you, you could be anyone you could be the cleaner and if you know you've got the ability to raise a patient's concerns um okay oh yeah so and I remember a consultant saying to me where I work the missed injury is quite often the one that continues to be a problem long term and it has been with me I've nearly got um full function um now this this is not I've never worn shoes like this and nor would I want to but this is about the psychological side of it and I it was about 18 months in and my foot is, I've got neurological problems with my foot. And I went to see an orthotist with a referral. And she told me that I would never be wearing um, shoes that didn't have full support. And that was the moment that I had my meltdown. And I'm told it could be anything, but it was shoes. It, it caused my meltdown. And no matter how tough and pragmatic and I'm going to get on with this, you are. I think that there's always going to be something that finally... Um, melts you down and I've always been a zipper I've always been zipping here there and everywhere I've always um you know run when I didn't have to um and it was really it's been very very difficult to be stopped from being how you are as a person as I say I would normally like I've got to do that I've got to do this and and you just can't anymore so the shoes thing was a real, real pivotal moment. I um I had a real meltdown about the shoes. And um, now the best rehab tool. Um, I came home and they kept my bed open, and um, I was able to stay at home. I had physio input um, to assess the house, but the best rehabilitation tool was a dog. I'd never had a dog before, and this flipping dog. He got me off the sofa every day. He got me out walking, even if it was only to the end of the road. He made me do it. If it was raining, if I was feeling miserable, if I was in pain, it was tough because the dog had to go out. So I know dogs aren't for everyone. He was my first dog. Um, he's called Scooby after the, the Subaru, the Scooby-Doo. And he forced me to work every day. And he gave me a focus and he kept me happy. Well, he was always happy. He kept me positive. 
Um, I had quite a few injuries and operations and lots of things that people said during the time that I was in hospital. I, as, as I've explained, I've been in the NHS for 33 years now. And there's many things that people said that really surprised me and really stuck with me. And it's not a it's not a telling off thing, but it's just think about what what you say. And I'm the I'm the queen of speaking before I think. Um, I've been told you walk like a duck. Um, I was told by my um, mother in law, no, my stepmother. Well, this will clip your wings. That was when I was in in A and E at Bristol. Um, just things that stick with you. The other thing I would say is when I was in the car um, and they were trying to get me out, they asked me my next of kin. Well, my next of kin is an 85 year old father and then a 19 year old son. Neither of them would have been any use. They're both in Birmingham. And my boyfriend, I didn't know his number. But if there's one tip, memorize your next of kin's phone number because he had to then get the 6.30 knock on the door from the police which is I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy. It was very, very traumatic for him. Um, kindness is absolutely king. I just wanted, when I was in that car, all I wanted, and I'm not a touchy-feely person at all. I don't like, you know, over demonstrative behaviour. All I wanted was someone to hold my hand. That was it, hold my hand. And it really does make a difference. Everyone was really busy doing things, but if you could just designate someone to just hold your hand and tell you what's going on, um, it, it really does make a difference. Um, please try and look at the whole patient. That was the thing with me. My wrist is, um, is, is an ongoing problem. It may not have been if it was sorted straight away. And as I say, check your horn. I don't know why on earth I didn't think to sound my horn, um, but check your horn. Get decent car insurance. I had cheap car insurance. They were absolutely rubbish. And the stress of that just added to everything. And maybe get a dog and never give up. Never give up. It's hard. It, it just, you know, you'll go five steps forward, two steps back, but never give up. There's, there is absolutely no point in giving up. The other thing that it's really brought home to me is the NHS is absolutely fantastic at saving your life and doing the needful things right away. But the follow-up is, is something completely different. The follow-up is really disjointed. A lot of the uh, continence things, the bowel things, the rehab things, the physio things, I had to arrange myself and I didn't know where to start. Um, it's, it's um, as I say, it is great at doing the right thing at the right time, but not so great for for follow-up and it, it was very very hard to try and get um, the right kind of follow-up. Um, I had brilliant care, I did have brilliant care overall. It, the one thing I feel like is that nobody looked at the overall patient like that was always the accident hospital and the major injuries unit mentality. Always look at the whole patient and just never dismiss things that seem insignificant and don't go back to work too early I went back after six months because um, I had to had a mortgage to pay and a colleague of mine said don't go back too early you'll get a you'll get a scotch egg and a pat on the head and then you'll be straight back into it I thought no no they know what I've been through and that's exactly what it was like two hours in and it was like you'd never been away so do not rush to get back don't be lazy obviously but do not rush to get back and they cancelled the balloon festival. After all that, they cancelled the balloon festival. Not in my honour, it was too windy, but it didn't really help that I was sitting in my room in Bristol and occasionally a hot air balloon would fly past the window as if to kind of remind me exactly what I was doing there. So thank you for listening. I hope I haven't gone on too much. If there's any questions about anything at all, I'm more than happy to answer them. I'm completely through it now. I've had brilliant counselling and I can talk about it all day long. Thank you.